let's start the phylum Porifera. Pori, porous, fera, bearing. These are the pore bearing animals. They're commonly called as sponges. Actually, the poriferans are the first metazoans, earliest metazoans. They are generally marine, means some are fresh waters, but mostly they are seen in the marine waters, in the oceans and in the seas. And the body is mostly asymmetrical body. Already we come across in the previous session that asymmetrical body is the one if you go through any plane is not possible of obtaining the identical images. So they are mostly asymmetrical but few are radially symmetrical. It is not mentioned in the NCRT book but generally they focused on asymmetrical nature of the sponges mostly. So, the level of organization in the animals is the cellular level of organization. As I mentioned earlier, no animal is unicellular. All animals are multicellular animals. Their body is constructed with many cells. Though their body is made up of with many cells, you know well, the cells are loose aggregates. And the level of organization, which is very primitive level of organization, a cellular level. These are the primitive animals, first animals, I mean earliest animals these are. The earliest metazoans are poriferans, sponges. Moving on, the unique character of the feature of this poriferans is water transport or canal system. It is a unique feature of the phylum porifera. You can see the different animals or there, the poriferans with the porous nature is given the sp sponges, different types of sponges with the porous nature. And this unique feature, the canal system is with the ostia. These are the inhalant apertures through which the water enters. Here we are showing the mark over here which indicating the water enters through this ostia. Is there minute pores, several minute pores are present on the surface of the body. And this water, it enters into the cavity called as spongocele. Seal money cavity. It is a cavity of the sponges. Water enters through ostia and enters into the spongocele and it leaves out through exhalant aperture called as osculum. Water enters through ostia, leaves out through osculum. In this picture also you are observing only the osculums are very few but ostia are numerous ostia are present but osculum is very few osculums are present. It is a unique cap property feature of this poriferans. For what sake this canal system, in what way this canal system is helpful? This canal system is helpful in gathering of the food, food gathering and is also helpful for respiratory exchange, I mean the exchange of gases, uh, intake of oxygen and leaving out of carbon dioxide and also the removal of the waste materials. In this way the canal system or water transport system is helpful. Moving on to the very next important point that is coanocytes. I am showing here the picture how they look that the collar cells they have a collar like structure and they have here you are observing a flagella like structure over here. This collar cells the coanocytes it surrounds the spongocele and canals. It is one of the previous neat question. The students uh, face this question as such like this, the coanocytes or collar cells lines or the spongocele or canals are lined by which cells? The coanocytes or the collar cells, they line the spongocele or canals. It's very important point, coanocytes or the collar cells lines the spongocele. What is spongocele? It is a cavity, it is a cavity of sponges. 
and thus coming to the next point about its digestion it is a intracellular digestion the digestion occurs inside the cells uh, based on your previous knowledge i hope you are remembering that with the introductory part of this animal kingdom in sponges though they are multicellular the cells are not organized to form as a tissues and you know well here these cells show functional isolation the cells are functionally isolated they perform different cells perform different functions the body of peripherans is supported by the skeleton made up of its spicules or spongin fibers these are the protein fibers and the spicules the spicules and the spongin fibers will constitute the skeleton and you know pretty well the skeleton will give support and protection to the organism moving on their sexuality their hermaphrodites hermaphrodites are nothing but you know the animals in which the sexes are united the sexes are not separate the sexes are united they are called as hermaphrodites or bisexual or monoecious these are all the terminology we can use the synonyms like hermaphrodites bisexual or monoecious the sexes are not separate uh, peripheral the sponges can able to produce both the male and the female gametes the male related and the female related the things are present in the same organism and it reproduce both asexually and sexually asexual reproduction is by fragmentation if a sponge is broken down into pieces each piece will develop into a, a new sponge fragmentation is a asexual mode of reproduction sexually it reproduce by producing gametes it produce the male gametes and the female gametes where the male and the female gametes will fuse inside the body of a sponge so we are referring it as a internal fertilization so the fertilization is internal because the gametes are uniting inside the body and the development during the development of a sponge it includes a larval stage which is differing from the adult and the development is indirect it passes through the larval stage they have several larval stages in different sponges and these are different quite different from the adult so such type of words you need to be in a memorized state that in which the development is direct in which the development is indirect and in whom the fertilization is what the type of fertilization is it is a uh, is it uh, external fertilization or internal fertilization so you want to concentrate a little bit on this so the development is indirect development because it including the larval stage and the fertilization is internal and moving on to the examples the pictures which you are seeing over there those are the examples of peripheron the sicon the scypha the sicon the scypha the spongilla fresh water sponge we said that generally majority of them are marine but few are fresh water among this the spongilla is a fresh water sponge u spongia bat sponge here so these are the good examples you need to uh, learn the examples and most important specifying the points like what i told the type of fertilization the type of development it is showing and the unique feature of the phylum porifera as i said earlier you should focus on a few points and if you go in a comparison way this chapter will become very easy for you to because though it's a memory based you need to memorize all the things related with one phyla and with other phyla but yet if you focus on a few points it will become a, a little bit easy for you comparatively the next phyla coelenterata or nidaria the coelenterates are nidarians why these two names what it refers actually before going to discuss about it let us discuss about its habit and habitat where the live and how would be these animals these are aquatic actually these are aquatic organisms they live in the water and they are mostly 
marine. Here the same thing like porifers. They also we mentioned there that generally marine means a few are fresh water. In the same sense here also mostly they are marine. So obviously there are a few of fresh waters and they are sessile. Money they are attached to the substratum. They cannot. Some are sessile like the picture which I draw over here the hydra they are sessile attached to the substratum they are attached and some are free swimming like jellyfishes some they'll swim freely in the water and uh, these nidarians you know well they are the earliest eumetazoans i mean the true animals kingdom animalia is also referred as metazoans you know well so the first metazoans are the porifers though their body is constructed with many cells there we mention the cells are not organized to form into tissues but the tissues are seen for the first time in the phylum nidaria so they exhibit tissue level of organization and they are diploblastic their body is constructed made up of with two germinal layers that is outer ectoderm and inner endoderm and in between these two layers there is an undifferentiated layer that's what we discussed as mesoglia though here it's not mentioning but you should take that points which mentioned earlier so that diploblastic organisms with tissue level of organization and as tissues are seen for the first time in these animals these are the true you met true metazoans or you can call it as a you metazoans first you metazoans you money true and coming to the symmetry what type of symmetry they exhibit radial symmetry the animals exhibit radial symmetry you know well what is radial symmetry any plane passing through the center of the animal it gives rise to the identical half so i am concluding all the points which are the basic phenomena these are they exhibit tissue level of organization diploblastic with radial symmetry as i said all are marine not all a majority of them are marine but all are aquatic all are aquatic but mostly marine so here also some are fresh water farms and as i said why we are calling it as a nidaria phylum nidaria based on what it termed as the phylum nidaria is due to the presence of the cells nidoblasts or nidocytes present on the tentacles this nidoblasts or nidocytes are the cells these are the stinging cells the stings because of the presence of these cells this phylum is named as nidaria and what for mam these nidaria these nidarians why they used to have this nidocytes and this nidocytes present over the tentacles they have a fluid filled capsule called as nematocyst they have a fluid filled capsule this because of this presence of nidaria possessing this nidoblast or nidocyte cells the predators or other animals they scared about this that they're, they're not going to nearby i mean they don't want to come nearby to this nidarians because they know well about what these cells will do so they discharge some thread like structure and that is helpful for anchorage to stick or to fix to some substratum or something defense mechanism as i said now these stinging cells will protect the nidarians no one is dare enough to approach it and they are also helpful to capture the prey they'll throw that thread like structure and that will sting to the prey and they'll grab it so overall the nidoblast cells are the nidocytes blasts or cytes you know that refers to the cells this nidoblast or nidocyte cells are helpful for anchorage capture of the prey and the defensive mechanism this is some of the one of the unique property of this nidarians and why is called as silentiron silentirata the name i told you the phylum's name silentirata or nidaria why nidaria we justified now 
coming to why it is cilentirata you are observing in the picture they have a cavity it's named by cilentiron the cavity's name is cilentiron or it's also called as a gastrovascular cavity why i'll justify it this cavity the cilentiron because of the presence of this cilentiron it's formally called as cilentirate now in majority of the times we refer them as nidarians rather than cilentirates but anyway in our ncrt big book most of the times they said like cilentirata so you can uh, consider this also no issues so cilentiron are this cavity it opens to the outside through a single opening you know we can call it as a sac like gut and this opening it serves as mouth during ingestion and anus during ejection and why it's called as gastrovascular cavity the food gets digested over here and also distributes from over here so gastro related to the digestion vascular related to the circulation so cilentiron is otherwise called as gastrovascular cavity and as it have only single opening that is mouth and this mouth is located on hypostome i'll write here this hypostome here mouth is located on hypostome you know well stomium mane it related to the mouth so this is regarding its cavity and all moving on to the next point regarding its digestion it shows both extracellular digestion and intracellular digestion students will get a doubt of basic thing ma'am when we are supposed to call it as extracellular and when it's called to be intracellular if digestion occurs outside the cell money in the cavity like cilentiron it's called as a extracellular digestion extra outside cellular cell the digestion is happening outside the cell if it happens in the cilentron it is extracellular and even the food is also digested in the cells lining the gut i mean endodermal cells if the food gets digested in the cells lining this gut i mean lining this cavity it's called as intracellular digestion so it takes both types of digestion happens here extracellular and intracellular moving on to the next point in some of the nidarians the skeleton is made up of with calcium carbonate the calcareous skeleton example for this like corals that semi precious stones the skeleton of nidarians we are using in the ornaments the semi precious stone the corals coming to the very unique feature of the phylum nidaria they exhibit dimorphism di two morpha forms the nidarians exhibit in two forms one is the polyp stage other is the medusa stage what is this polyp and medusa you can see the difference between these two pictures the polyp the good example like hydra and adamsia these are polyp forms in them the body is cylindrical shaped body and they are sessile as i draw the line underneath it represents their sessile attached to the substratum so they have cylindrical shaped body sessile and you are observing the mouth is oriented upwards in them the mouth orientation is upwards over here and coming to the case of here one more thing the medusoid forms in the medusoid forms you are observing these are umbrella shaped structures and these are free swimming forms and in them the mouth is orienting downwards this is cylindrical body this is umbrella shape mouth is oriented upwards here the mouth is oriented downwards these are sessile and thus these are free swimming so polyp and medusa in some of the nidarians in whom they possess these two forms they exhibit the alternation of generation we said like the polyp stages like hydra and adamsia the medusoid forms like arelia and jellyfishes in jellyfishes the body is umbrella shaped and they are free swimming and moving on to this very important point here 
So many important points you'll come across in this phyla. So concentrate on those points. I'll make up once later at last. In the forms of nidarians, in some of the nidarians whom they possess, this polyp and this medusoid forms, they show alternation of generation or we can call it as metagenesis. What's this alternation of generation? As I said that they possess the two forms of polyp and medusa. The polyp form undergo asexual reproduction and forms the medusoid form. Medusoid form undergoes sexual reproduction and forms the polyp form. There is an alternation of generation. Asexual followed by sexual and sexual followed by asexual form. The good example for this is obelia. Obelia is a good example for this alternation of generation or metagenesis. Examples, the physalia, Portuguese man of war. The shape of this looks like a warship of Portuguese. Physalia, Portuguese man of war. Adamsia, the sea anemone, which is also the polypoid form. Penatula, sea pen, pen, pen. Okay, already I told you mostly they are marine. Gorgania, sea fan, it's like looks like a hand fan. And meandrina, it is a brain coral. As I said, the corals are the semi-precious stones, as I said. And what to concentrate in this phylum, Porifera? We said like some unique features. They possess the nidoblasts or nidocyte cells, which helpful for them in the defensive and other purposes. And they have the dimorphic nature of polyp and medusoid forms. And some, they exhibit alternation of generation like obelia. And moreover, I told you already, focus on the examples. You need to mug up or you need to go through several times in order to know both the scientific names and also the common names. The next phyla, Tenophora. Tenophorans are commonly called as sea walnuts or cum jellies. The name itself indicating they are marine forms, sea walnuts or cum jellies. They are exclusively marine. The previous two phylas, mostly marine they are, Porifirans and Nidarians, they are mostly marine. But Tenophorans are exclusively marine. No freshwater form is represented from this phyla. You can see some of the comparative features between the phylum Nidaria and the Tenophora. Both are diploblastic, show tissue level of organization, radially symmetrical animals and even the digestion in both of them also both extracellular and intracellular digestion. So you can see the comparative ones like in both the Nidarians and the Tenophora members they are of radial symmetrical diploblastic organisms with tissue level of organization and even the digestion is both extracellular and intracellular digestion. And where though it differs, in which phenomenon it differs with the Nidarians? In Nidarians, they have nidoblasts or nidocyte cells, but these don't have the, so those nidoblast cells or nidocyte cells. Nidoblasts or nidocyte cells are absent in the members of this tenophora. And in the tenophora members, they have some special feature. They have external eight rows of ciliated comb plates and this is the characteristic feature you can see in the picture they have eight rows of comb like plates are present they are externally located ciliated structures as they possess cilia obviously they are helpful for locomotion and moving on to the next a very interesting characteristic feature of tenophora members bioluminescence you know, bio, life, living organisms, luminescence, light. The emission of light from the living organisms is called as bioluminescence. The bioluminescence is the characteristic feature of the phylum Nidaria. They emit the light from their body. For what sake they emit the light for the body? In order to attract their prey, in order to attract their mates, and also in order to make their st predator stunned. If suddenly a light glows, obviously will be stunned. So bioluminescence is the property, a characteristic feature, a special important phenomenon of the phylum Tenophora members. Coming to their 
reproductive part. They are bisexual. Sexes are not separate. The sexes are united. And as you learn the same phenomenon in Nidaria members, they are monoecious or hermaphrodites. Sexes are not separate. They are united. So we are using three to four terminology in order to refer it. And the reproduction, important point as I said like exclusively marine, in the same way the reproduction in these animals is only through sexual reproduction. They reproduce only sexually. In Nidarians we come across both asexual and sexual, but here only sexual reproduction. And the fertilization is external, the gametes fuse outside the body in their media and the development is indirect development, so they pass through the larval stage. Development is indirect, fertilization is external. Coming to the examples of this, Pleurobrachia and Tinoplana. Pleurobrachia and Tinoplana are the good example for the members of Tinophora. So you want to focus on the points like how many rows of the comb-like plates are present? Eight rows, ciliated, meant for what? A cilia, obviously for locomotion. And what is a special feature? Bioluminescence, exclusively marine and reproduce only through sexual reproduction. Next phyla, Plati helminthes. Plati money, flat. Helminthes means worms. These are flat worms. Their body is dorsoventrally flattened body. Hence, they are called as flat worms. Their body looks like a, like a ribbon or like a leaf. It's flattened body. And most of the Plati helminthes members are endoparasite. Endo, inside. They live parasitic, they lead a parasitic life inside the body of host and majority of them are the parasites on human beings. But few are the free living forms are also there like planarians which are the free living members of this platyhelminthes. And coming to their uh, descriptive phenomenon, these are the first triploblastic animals. That the triploblastic means, you know, their body is made up of three germinal layers. They possess the three germinal layers, the outer ectoderm, the middle mesoderm, inner endoderm. In the previous classes, I told you the mesoderm in triploblastic animals is responsible for the complexity of organisms. So that triploblastic, bilaterally symmetrical and they show what type of cement? Coelom, you know, acelomates, no coelom. Coelom is absent in them. And the level of organization is organ level of organization. You don't need to uh, go get a confused over here, no need of confusion, because already all this terminology you come across in the case of this, the first topics itself. And coming to the some of the parasites like tinea solium, the tapeworm, in them, in order to lead a parasitic mode of life, they have hooks and suckers. They have hooks and suckers in order to attach to the host body. For addition phenomenon to act like a hold fast. These are hold fast organs to lead an endoparasitic life. If you talk about the tinea solium, the tapeworm, it is a gut parasite, it lives in the gut. Whenever the gut shows this contractions, I mean the peristaltic movements, there's a chance of expelling this parasite outside along with the fecal matter. In order to avoid it, in order to prevent that ex expelling of this worm outside, they need to attach, they'll attach to the wall of the gut inside with the help of this hooks and suckers. Next phyla. Ask Helminthes, the pseudocelomate phyla. In some of the books, it's also referred as a nematoda, but according to the NCRT concept, it's Ask Helminthes, the pseudocelomate phyla as they are. And coming to this, they're commonly called as round worms. Why? If you do the cross-sectional view, they look round in shape. The cross-sectional view of these worms is round, hence they are called as round worms and they are free living organisms. You can see a diversity in their living. Some are free living, aquatic, terrestrial, 
and some are parasite on plants and animals. They can, there are different modes of living as seen in this phyla, as Kelmanthes phyla. As I said, all the pseudomate, pseudocelomate phylas are incorporated in this. And they are triploblastic, bilaterally symmetrical, and pseudocelomates. Already you learnt about what are pseudocelomates. Here in these animals, the mesoderm is scattered as a pouches in between ectoderm and endoderm. Though they have a cavity, but it's not a true cavity, it's just is not lined by the mesoderm and is not formed by the mesoderm. Hence, we are calling it as a fall pseudocelomate. And the level of organization is the organ system level of organization in platyhelminthes organ level. And this is here organ system level of organization. Coming to the gut part, they show complete gut. We can say here it is a tube within a tube organization, a tube, a tube within a tube organization here. A complete gut is seen, I mean a tube like gut where one opening for ingestion, another opening for ejection. They have two openings and previously whatever we discussed in the phylas like Nidaria and in the members of Platyhelminthes, they have a sac like gut with a single opening, incomplete gut, but here as a complete gut. And the gut is non-muscular, but pharynx part is muscular. It is a highly developed muscular pharynx is seen. Generally, the body wall is muscular, but alimentary canal is non-muscular, but pharynx is highly developed muscular part here. That's a, a phenomenon that you want to focus on. Coming to their excretory system, excretory one here, the excretory system includes the tube which eliminates the waste through the pore called as excretory pore. Excretory tubes and excretory pore play a role in the elimination of waste. Moving on to their reproductive part, here it is, that dioecious. Dioecious money, you know, sexes are separate. They are male and the female worms, moreover, they exhibit the sexual dimorphism. You can see in the pictures over there, the male and the female show clear demarcation. Male is short with a curved posterior end, whereas the female is long with a straight posterior end. They are sexually dimorphic, sexually two forms, male and the female, dioecious. Males are shorter, with a posterior curved end and curved tail and uh, whereas in the females you can see the posterior end is straight and they are of long comparatively with the males, the clear demarcation. And coming to their fertilization, they show internal fertilization, they exhibit internal fertilization and moreover the development may be either direct development or indirect development. Because some of the Askhelminthes members are viviparous, they can give birth to the young one. No need to go with that much of deviation, but in order to justify that, in some the development is direct. They don't pass through the larval stages, but in some it is indirect development. Examples, Ascaris, the common roundworm, and Ucraria, the phyladial worm, which you'll come across the type study in another chapter, the structural organization in animals. And the Ucraria is the phyladial worm where you'll come across the type study in human health and diseases chapter. And ankylostoma is commonly called as a hookworm. Ascaris, the common roundworm, Ucraria, the phyladial worm, ankylostoma, the hookworm. So what need to uh, stress the points here in the aspect of neat, neat point of view here, a complete gut, pseudocelomates, a tube within a tube organization, and moreover, sexually dimorphic structures, male and the female, is clearly demarcated from one with other.